39-38 expedition, which Rudolf Hess and, and Goering signed off on. They were like, hey, go there. Go find ruins of Atlantis or something. That's the story. Um, they, the SS were certainly involved in all that stuff because they knew it, it contained ancient technology, probably. You know, I mean, these stories sound fantastical until you start piecing the big picture together. And it took me 30 years to do that. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not easy at all. It, it, it's not meant to be easy. This, you know, when, the, when the Russian and Polish archives started opening them, and this is where Nick Cook found his information and Igor Watowski on the, the Wonder Waffle. That was astounding. We may never have learned, because in America we have the worst cover up of all that World War II information. I went to the NASA archives in Maryland and you know, trying to find stuff about Hans Kammler and everything, and there's just one page. Oh, he was a contractor. And, you know, I mean, everything's redacted. Right. Yes, my dad and I have done multiple FOIA requests on Paul Mellon. I've heard from all kinds of people. He has probably around 10,000 pages of OSS documents from the war. What's so secret about World War II that they refuse? And they refuse my dad, who is, you know, had a high-level clearance. So what are they hiding? Well, you know, it's I funny a lot because of this stuff I'm talking about. Um, I'd like to gauge your opinion on this because Tom DeLong said that he <clears throat> was told that World War II was an extraterrestrial war fought by humans. Would you agree with that? I think there's good evidence to suggest that. If you go back in time, I think a lot of wars are proxy wars. The, the battle in, in, in the religious text between light and darkness, angels and demons. I mean, it's fairly clear. Um, the Earth has been Grand Central Station for probably 12 billion years. I don't believe the 4 billion. Um, I have reason to believe that, but that's a long story. But it's much older than we're taught. History is a lie written by the winners. That I can tell you for sure. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous how the history books have been redacted and everything. And, and you know, all the books on Hitler are written by MI6, you know, guys. Like Hugh Trevor Roper, you know. I mean, it's ridiculous the history we're taught. And um, that's really what got me on this road was, you know, everything is a lie. So, yeah, I think, I think that uh, throughout history, every war, there are people with skin in the game. You know, if you get over that leap of faith, you know, that hump, I call it, you know, of disbelief, get over that. It's like, look, you know, Earth is a war prize. It's a garden planet. It's a school of hard knocks for the metaphysical uh, learning curves, you know, your higher self, your past lives, incarnations. It's it's this many things, but it's a special place. And I think there's a reason we have 12 strands of DNA. I think that's on purpose. Apparently that's unique. I don't know if it's unique in our galaxy or the universe, but it's said to be unique. And so, yeah. We are the probably, I think, we're the product of 22 different experiments back in the day before the Great Flood. Not just the Anunnaki, but you know, 21 other uh, ET races were like, "Hey, this sounds great," you know. And um, you know, some people came to Earth, you know, 100,000 years ago, and they're like, "Hey, let's do the llama, you know, let's create a hybrid llama and do the tulips in the Amazon, you know, or the orchids in the Amazon." They're like, yeah, that's great. You know, and they hang out for a couple thousand years or a couple hundred years. They're like, oh, this was cool. We'll come back later. And they just split. They split town. And so, you know, all the megaliths all over the world, the pyramids, everything. You no, know, these were high civilizations all throughout history. And by all, all accounts, Atlantis was, man, people were coming and going all the time. People with different skin colors and this, that, and the other. People really tall, really short, you know. It, it's all there in the legends and history books it all makes sense but there was always wars always you know lemuria and atlantis were said to be at war atlantis had wars with the sons of belial versus the children of the law of one you know i'm a i'm a devotee of hermetic law and the law of one i that makes sense to me we're all one in the cosmos attack somebody you're attacking yourself you know it's good luck trying to get you know generals and admirals on board with that Hey, let me. Can I read from you from the Hermetica? Get away from me! You know, it's 
it's fairly obvious once you've done the big picture work. That's what I, my specialty is. I'm not one of these gurus who has a, uh, you know, one of the messiahs in the UFO world, you know, the big people like Greer and others, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I take, I take everyone's perspective into consideration. So I cast a huge net as wide as I possibly can. Um, you know, and, and, in the UFO community, it has its own caste system. Oh, I don't believe those people. You know, it's self-fractured. It, it's got uh, compartmentalization and, and uh, factions of its own. And that's why I came out uh, and did an interview with my friend Eric Hecker, who's an ex-U.S. Navy guy who's in, in Antarctica. He and I have some things in common. And uh, he thinks he's part of this covert secret space program and possibly the super soldier program. And those people get no love in the disclosure community. They're the pariahs. Everyone just shits on them. And it's like, they deserve a voice. Well, actually that, that leads into something I wanted to ask you because one person that you've mentioned in some of your interviews is Laura Eisenhower, the great granddaughter of president Dwight Eisenhower. Um, now, as you pretty much just said, within the ufo community um you know people like this and especially specifically laura eisenhower has been widely dismissed people are very quick to say that she should not be taken seriously i like you try to maintain an open mind but um, what would you say to those within the ufo community who dismiss the opinions and claims of people like laura eisenhower you know i don't lecture anyone i, I tell people you know trust your own mind think for yourself but i think everyone's deserves to be listened to considered their stories, their, their wisdom, knowledge. I think, I think it's in, important to do that. You know, people can discern the law of discernment, which is a hermetic law. You have to discern all this stuff for yourself. The entire disclosure movement, that's a very personal thing to everyone. And so I, I think Laura's stories are, are worth a lot of consideration. As far as I know, I could be wrong, but she, myself, and Chris are the only committee of 300 family members involved in the disclosure i i don't know of anyone else i maybe someone out there can say oh i know somebody a rockefeller or somebody i think lawrence rockefeller was yeah he he was involved with greer, with greer and, and yeah that was that whole shit show with Modesto yeah got, got the clintons involved and things like that oh no that was that was a shit show and um you know it's not greer's fault but i i believe you know, Greer, that they told him to shut up and it's not your, none of your business. And Greer stood up and says, it's my business. I live on this planet. You know, I have to live with everyone. Law of one. And so, you know, but the black hats in the room, you know, deep state folks, they didn't want this and none of this to come out. And so, you know, that's, to my knowledge, that, that's all. The three of us, I, I could be wrong. I, I really don't know. I know I have four family members who are kind of sort of interested in all this but from more of a spiritual carl young you know atlantis kind of mystical side of it um i'm more hardcore military historian i like to you know that's where the space where i come from but i try to really read a lot of philosophy and metaphysics because none of this is going to make sense that's my other gentle advice to everyone is if you don't understand the metaphysics and philosophy that all these people were talking about through the ages, you're not going to really get the big picture understanding. The horror of it all will overwhelm you. I mean, people say, well, Warner's crazy. You know, even my friend, my friends are like, he's insane, but we love him anyway. You know, it's like, I have lost part of my sanity. Yeah, you damn skippy I have. You know, anyone would. We're human beings. We're really creatures of love, forgiveness, and understanding and community, not these you know, at, look at the ancients. I mean, we weren't created as this warrior race. I think we've been manipulated to become, you know, become warriors and we're good at it. We don't have the, you know, by all accounts, we don't have a good reputation out in the galaxy. And people are like, oh, Earth are humans, you know, hands off. Whoa. These guys are you know. This is, uh, you know, it's something I've said as well is that we're so far out of equilibrium with 
science and spirituality, physics, metaphysics, you know, we're, it's kind of like our technological progress is up here and then our spiritual and empathetic and philosophical progress is all the way down there. And, you know, we need to be operating at some level of symbiosis between these two things. And I do worry, especially as a young man looking forward as into the projection of where we're heading, you know, as a very technocratic species, uh, you know, whether or not we are too far gone to reclaim that spirituality. My, my personally, my only real hope is that through the medium of technology, quantum mechanics, quantum computing, all of these new emergent uh, studies and mediums, that we might be able to regain some level of spirituality through a scientific paradigm. Because it just kind of feels like we're never going to go back to kind of tribal nature, drinking ayahuasca in the middle of a jungle somewhere. Like as, as a general species, that's probably not the projection, <clears throat> sorry, probably not the direction we're heading in. But I, I, I have to feel like there's some level of hope that we can still regain that conscious aspect of our being. But maybe it will happen through some sort of scientific technological revolution that brings consciousness back into the conversation what do you think uh yes but um the technology that is in the deep state and the military industrial complex and all, and all the all that the corporations military contractors that's all really neat stuff um we're probably out in the galaxy with a space fleet secret spoke secret space program is most likely real. That's why they created the Space Force. Why did Trump pass the space mining bill? You know, these are all things you need to consider to sort of put this whole puzzle together. Um, and it's impossible to put the whole puzzle together, but you can try. I've tried. Um, spirituality and our ascension to higher levels of uh, dimensionality and, uh, you know, that is probably our destiny. Uh, I think the people that, you know, creating hybrid races is no big deal. You know, that's, a lot of people are like that. We be, breed horses and dogs that way. You know, big deal. Um, everyone's a hybrid, you know, basically. Out there, here, everywhere. Um, the spirituality that we have, I think, is growing. You know, the, just, you know the, the Great Awakening is happening. I've seen progress over 30 years. My wife and I have had incidents of synchronicity all the time. Um, I had my friend's high school kids come up to me and they said, you know, what do you think about the secret space program and stuff? And I said, well, think for yourself, you know, and, you know, it's a possibility we have to contend with. And so there are people waking up and it has to be, you know, the spiritual component of that is innate within us. So I've become more spiritual. I'm not a religious person. I didn't believe in any of that. I think religions are, you know, somewhat artificial that they they have a lot of wisdom and history in them but there's so much disinformation you know i think that probably you know they created religions you know whoever the the controllers of the world in ancient times were like oh, we need religions you know by all accounts the anunnaki created it you know they had a caste system the anunnaki kings the, the lighter skinned people tended to the bed chambers and temples and kitchens the brown people were the warriors and did some other chores. And then the darker skinned people did the hard, brutal work in the fields. And you could look that up. You know, and these people that, you know, that are our slaves, they need uh, religions. Something that, you know, worship us as gods. But then it became, you know, by the Roman times, the monotheism became the, the cult of, you know, solar cults, Mithraism. You know, these all dovetailed into Christianity. And Constantine and the, the people in Istanbul, which is, you know, back then it was Constantinople, uh, they probably burned the Library of Alexandria and the Library of Apollo in Rome and said, oh, no, we're going to, you know, were there some ETs involved in that? Probably, you know. They probably look like us. I don't know, you know, who they were, but I, I, strongly feel the Anunnaki were. <laughs> no, they never left. Everyone's like, oh, the Anunnaki left. No. I had an admiral once tell me that ETs, I said the word, I said to the Anunnaki, and he's like, well, I can't speak to that, but ETs walk the halls of the Pentagon every damn day. Every goddamn day, he said. Can, you say, which, your, can you say which admiral that was? Or, uh... No, I'm not <laughs> going to go there. Um, but, you know, 
that was probably, you know, 2000, 2002, somewhere in there. And I, I was like, yeah, I believe that. It's, it's not this big deal everyone thinks it is. Oh, my gosh, us versus them. We are all equal citizens of the cosmos. I truly believe that. You know, law of one, you know, hermetic law, you get into all that philosophy. But it, it's, you know, we're all different. And so, you know, I think ETs out there, by all accounts, they're, they're very neutral. They're like, you know, that's just a perspective. Good and evil, you know, yin and yang our duality as human, be human beings. I mean, I struggle with my duality every day, you know? And this is like, you know, everyone's like, it's, it's the people versus the, you know, the royals and the, and the 300 families and the deep state and the military. No, you know, a lot of those people believe in what I'm talking about. Um, they're just caught with, you know, national security contracts and death threats. Um, I've talked to some of these people. They're like, I wish I could do more, but they will, you know, I, I remember one congressman said, you know, look up the wood chipper scenario. This is in the 90s, I think. I said, what the fuck is that? And I talked to some of my intelligence people. And they're like, yeah, when senators and congressmen, I don't know about today, but, but back then, the 90s and before that, they said if they dare interest themselves into, you know, the black programs, unacknowledged special access programs, and they get too nosy, they're shown the wood chipper. You know, they, they come in the middle of the night, they put a bag over your head, and inject you with something, take you out to some farm, and they, you know, there's 10 of you in a, in a line, and then they take the poor asshole down the end of the line, they put him through the wood chipper, and they smash everyone's face in the bloody goo. And said, you will not interest yourselves in our business anymore. You will Jesus, toe the line. You've been told that's, that's something that actually was told to you is real? That happened? Yeah. yeah. Wow. My dad and I was disgusted. He, you know, he said, you know, it's a tough world, son. You know, I don't care how much money people have. Uh, I don't care if you're a billionaire. You cannot shield yourself from the horrors of the world once you wake up to it. Uh, you're still beholden to, you know, illness and, and uh, depression and everything. You know, there's no, you know, once you're starting to piece all this together and you're awake, there's no going back. Um, you know, my, my dad did a great thing. He, he took me with him all around the world and he didn't want me to be some rich candy ass kid. You know, he always said, got to work. I was always a workaholic like him. I always had a job. I was always doing something. I didn't want to be like the kids at the yacht club or the young people, you know, who only talk about yachts and golf and tennis and, you know, maybe, you know, how beautiful, you know, the queen's dress was that day at Ascot. You know, that's what these people talk about. You just don't talk about deep things. Most of them are just oblivious to everything. It's like what I wrote Jean-Luc, you know, they're asleep at the switch on the yacht. Oh, I have to varnish my yacht. You know, which, which color do you like? You know, my God, I had um, a funny story. I was at the yacht club in Cape Cod one year before they threw me out. <laughs> Dress code violations, cussing. You know, I was not the sort. But I was married to another you were, woman. You were too fun. Right, I was I'm married to my ex-wife, and she said, oh, no, we have to be members of the Yacht Club. And, you know, I was, so I was up there in Cape Cod, and this group of my friends were with some group of golfers, and they said, my God, how can you be into all these conspiracy theories and UFOs? Why can't you be like the rest of us and play golf and learn to you know, do hedge fund stuff and fuck over the small people of the world? Yeah, you know, basically. And I said... Um, you know, I liked to play tennis back then. It was, it was actually good for your timing, but um, I hated golf. I think it's a stupid game, you know, men doing business deals and the deep state guys going, well, we should, you know, implement this anti-gravity craft in Afghanistan and all while playing golf. And I said to him, you know, and they, so they started laughing at me and everything. And, you know, I'm always the butt of the joke. And I'm like, that's fine. And then I went up to him. I said, tell me if I'm wrong. Golf, you use one, you, it takes one ball in golf. And they're like, yes, of course. And I'm like, as far as I know, being a pro racer, it takes two. So that shut them up. So I have little time for these snotty people who don't do any deep thinking or don't think for themselves. And I'm not saying that's everyone's fault, but people by and large are willfully ignorant. I had another friend, a close friend, Recently, he said, he said, 
I'm sure you're right about some of this stuff, you know, but I don't want to know. Ignorance is bliss. And I said, all right, buddy, ignorance is bliss, huh? Well, ignorance is stupid, being stupid and arrogant, and that the bliss is temporary. So what good is it? He's like, I don't care. He's, you know, slugs down uh, 10 whiskeys. You know, it, people are willfully ignorant. And that's what, you know, you can't red pill people. They have to be in the, in the process themselves. And this gets into soul contracts and metaphysics and reincarnational lives. You know, you, oh, what, you know, the tick the option boxes like you're at a car dealership. Oh, what should I do in this next life? Oh, I want, I want to do this and this. And I could see myself checking all the boxes. And, you know, oh, you know, I want a spine full of titanium. And oh, I want to go through all that, you know. But other people are like, nah. Hang out in the Bahamas and read books, and drink what and drink rum drinks. But freedom, they're still, freedom you know, of will, yeah. <laughs> right. But they're still doing their jobs if they incarnate on Earth, according to all the philosophers and everybody, because you are of the light. Um, if unless you want to be, you know, in the darkness, which is totally fine. You know, go do your thing, Mister Hitler and you know Stalin. But if you want to just hang out, you know, you're still doing your job at sort of raising the vibration of the planet. You know, our heart chakras are connected to Mother Earth. And so that's kind of it gets into why um, Earth has been this very popular place for people to come and conquer and war and, you know, and do all this thing is because as human beings, uh, we have a very powerful heart chakra that's connected to Mother Earth. Now, that's something you can drill down on in metaphysics, but um, I'm trying to do better, you know, you know, I can't just, yeah, Nazi anti-gravity weapons with atomic, you, know. you can't just do that. You have to understand that side of it. So, you know, all the pretty women on YouTube doing, well, you know, here's what we do today at our heart chakras and crystals. And that's all very important stuff, but it's not my purview <laughs> per se, you know, but I try to understand it and consider it. And I was like, all oh, these crystal hippies, you know, God damn it, you know, they're idiots. And then I'm like, whoops, you know, they've got a point. Because all this high tech and the military industrial complex, it is crystal based. I don't know if you've heard of the rectangle they found uh, on one of these crashed UFOs sometime. I think it was you know, 40, 50 years ago. And they couldn't figure out what it, what it was. And they put it on a shelf, you know, and then one day some clever guy was like attached something to it to do a power drain. And it was like, whoa, the whole building lit up. And this thing is a free energy device that's this small. Yeah, I think that's the one that uh, Stephen crystal. Greer mentioned. Yeah, it's that, all uh, crystal. Be... Yeah, it's all crystal yeah. based technology. And so this gets into the vacuum of space time and, and torsion fields and all that good stuff. And um, oh, I wanted, you know, as far as um, the Sufi wisdom and Gurdjieff, George Gurdjieff, what he found was very interesting in his books when he went to visit the Sar Moon in Afghanistan. And that was the whirling dervishes. And I write about this in my new book. The whirling dervishes, somehow that Sufism mystery school figured out, ooh, if we can train ourselves to dance for 24 hours or whatever it is without getting sick or dizzy, and it takes years, a lifetime to develop, they create a torsion field in the brain. And so that allows the pineal gland to activate through what you know, Rudolf Steiner and everyone is calling the eighth sphere of reality, which is our false control system on the planet, which has to exist because there's no way they can get away with all this stuff for thousands of years without it. It's just logic. And so, you know, I've got my character Beatrice, and she's you know fighting a war. She's like, oh, George Gurdjieff comes to her in a microsecond and says, you know, whirling dervish, you idiot. And so she applies that. You know, she's kind of a, a fuck up and, and, and an idiot, but she, she applies that. And they were able, it's a high performance meditation. And so they're, they're dancing in front of all the kings and, you know, the potentates throughout history, these whirling dervishes, but they're connecting with the universal consciousness. Ha ha, ha this is what we're doing. And so they found a way around. It, it's always a workaround in life. I think in the universe, there's always a workaround. Oh, we got a problem, it's impossible. The word impossible is, was probably given to us by some nefarious group. Yeah. It doesn't it have, nothing is impossible in the universe. Even my O and I friend, you know, when we talk about stuff, he's like, yeah, everything's possible. There's no impossibility of anything. 
which is why it's so sad to see everyone arguing in the disclosure movement. They're at each other's throats. You know, you know, I, you guys found me. I really wasn't going to come out to anybody, but you know, like John Luke and I shoot the breeze and I thought, oh, this is synchronicity. I'm going to go with this. My wife and I had talked about it for a long time, you know, because, you know, I'm nobody really important in the scheme of things, but you know, I just have a weird family story to tell um, in conjunction with all this new knowledge. Well, I have to admit that, um, and I've said this in our three-part series, and for everyone listening, by the way, I'll link that in the description box below. So if you haven't checked that out, I'd recommend checking that out because we do go through quite a lot of different things uh, regarding your book and obviously the emails you sent. But um, yeah, no, that, that's that's something that I was... Uh, oh God, I've completely forgotten my train of thought then. I had a really nice point that I wanted to nail down. You know, and it's just I'll gone... connect with you. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, what were you saying? I don't know, something about the emails of John Luke. No, uh, you were saying something. I've compl- you know Luke what? Picard of Star Trek. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I have completely forgotten. I'm maybe, all right, I'm going to try and remember it. But what I would like to segue into just real quick, um, especially just in regards to kind of present day discussions. I'm listening. Yeah, no worries. Um, because a tangible connection to the modern day UFO or UAP transparency efforts is your third cousin, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon. Now, Chris played an integral role in the dislodging and dissemination of the now famous Navy videos that captured the uh, unidentified aerial phenomena during naval training exercises. He's worked with the New York Times in order to push this information out into the mainstream, and he was a member of Tudor Stars Academy of Arts and Science. He's since left his role within TTSA, and we can get into uh, some of the possible reasons for that in a moment. But first of all, um, you've called him a dear friend, so is it fair to say that you and Christopher are close? We're not super close, but we've known each other. We went to camp together in 1973, so we've known each other for a long time. And I would see him here and there. I knew his, his brother, who's now passed away, Matthew, a little better. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Chris and I have had conversations. Uh, he came to my farm. We had a great five-hour conversation over a couple of scotches, you know. And I know his family. I went to the Mellon reunion uh, a few years ago with my wife. Uh, there she is. Come, come say hi to Jay. Hey, Jay, how are you? Hey, uh, how are you doing? There's <laughs> nice the brains of the operation right there. She's smarter than I am. <laughs> Pleasure Always to good to have you. a spouse or, or, you know, a wife that's smarter than you. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. That's my gentle advice to you as a young man. I'm just here to support him. There you oh. go. Ah. <laughs> You're up at one in the morning discussing all this. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Secret. Don't tell him our secrets. So, no, no. Well, nice meeting you anyway. Yeah, yeah you too. Chris, I mean, you know, uh, you know, Here's the thing. My dad uh, and Stephen Greer with his comment about my father and Chris Mellon coming forward with Lou Elizondo publicly four years ago, um, that made disclosure my business. You know, my wife and I are very private people. Um, we like to mingle with all kinds of people. I, I, I enjoy, we have a pretty quiet life, really. Um, and I like Chris, you know, I've know, I've met his family. Uh, he's a great family man. Um, my opinion, and I don't know Lou Elizondo, but my, my friend, Captain Daniel Cross, you know, retired, he knows Lou. And so we had a good conversation about Lou. And so my opinion is they are on the opposite end of, they are in the disclosure movement because they, they brought this topic alive. It was completely dead. No one was really listening to anything about UFOs, not in the mainstream public. And all of a sudden, in 2017, they brought that footage out. And so they continue, Chris continues to write articles in the Washington Post or the Times, you know, New York Times or the Hill and wherever else. And they keep that on the boil. So I commend them for that. I really do. And I told Chris that. And, you know, it, our conversation is private, but what I can tell you is that, uh, you know, he's like, oh, you and Tom DeLong are into the wild stuff. And I said, I don't know Tom DeLong. You know, he seems like a nice guy. His heart's in the right place. You know, I don't know about the skateboard thing, but whatever, man. You know, um, and I said, such an odd choice for all you, you know, Jim Semi man, Hal Putoff, and, you know, all these guys who are, you know, insiders and spooks and, and you know, and he's like, oh, well, he was our front man, and we're trying to get the youth of, you know, 
younger people involved and you know, trying to lighten up their image of this thing. And I said, I can understand that. It's still really a goofy thing. Why didn't you call me? And I could have advised you on something a little different. But, um, you know, I'm like, Chris, if you don't understand some of the wild stuff, why are you with Tom DeLonge? And he's talking about the wild stuff. And I think, you know, he's like, he's their front man. You know, a lot of the disparaging th- people will call him a useful idiot, which is an Intel term. Um, I don't know about that. I don't know Tom. I've never met him. But, um, you know, his free, free Masonic symbols on his guitar and other things, you know, his book with Peter Lavenda, The Secret Machines, that was very mild stuff. Uh, my books hit the nail really hard. I mean, I don't hold back. Um, that's just me. Um, so, you know, I sat down and I explained how a black triangle, the TR3B or the new G model, you know, these are old stuff from the eighties that we have flying around and they're going to soon let that, let that out in the space force as part of low level disclosure. Have you been told so, that? Yeah. A big deal. Anti-gravity. It's not that hard once you know the trick. You know, and people invent anti-gravity toys all the time on YouTube, and then they get a knock on the door and say, "Well, we, Boeing owns the patents to free energy, buddy." You know, it's it's an inside joke. All the insiders are laughing. Everybody, you know, we're still debating anti-gravity. It's like ridiculous. And the ancients had it. You know, they, we've probably always had it on Earth in one form or another. You know, it's not that big a deal. The big deal is what constitutes the wild stuff that Chris and I were talking about. And I sat down, I drew him the TR3B. Here's the plasma ring. It's carbon fiber, titanium. You know, the, the maneuvering nodes are, you know, there's hexagonal sacred geometry in there. And, you know, the maneuvering nodes use a, a powdered quartz and ballistic glass, you know, with monotonic gold on one side and lead insulator. And they do high voltage. You get a torsion field on three nodes and it maneuvers beautifully. Seven minutes from ground level to the moon. Big deal. You know, this is not the big deal stuff. The hardware that everyone, oh, I, American Airlines, we saw a UFO the other day. It was shaped like the hot dog with mustard. You know, the hardware is not an issue. You know, it's what are they, you know, Chris and, and, and Lou are gatekeepers. And I said, man, I know, I know you're on a short leash. I didn't mean that as, as a disparaging comment. I said, I know you're beholden to national security stuff, you know, but come on. Even if 5% of the wild stuff, the dark stuff, you know, the wild stuff is true, it's astounding. But it's also horrifying because you've got my labs and abductions and, you know, all these people are insane. You know, I was abducted in all these grays and there was a mantid being and a German, you know, you know, in a black leather coat. I mean, Barney and Betty Hill said that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous that we're still talking about this childish shit. And he's like, you know, oh, no, you know, you know, we got up, you know, the American people will panic. American people will panic. And I said, you know, I've gotten to know a lot of American people, blue collar, middle class, rich people. It doesn't matter. The American people aren't stupid. They may be ignorant uh, by design, but they're not stupid. Yeah, a lot of people will panic and freak out. You know, their religious beliefs and everything like that will be challenged. No, look at 9-11. That brought America together. Whoever was responsible for 9-11, some faction within the deep state, you know, arguing with another faction, you know, look what we can do if you disclose something, buddy. Something like that probably happened. American people didn't become afraid. It galvanized this country. I was down in, in, in Georgia filming my a documentary film. Uh, and I remember a big dually pickup truck, you know, exhaust stacks and twin turbos and everything. And it had a big stars and bars on the back of it. And, you know, God, guns and country and everything. I, and it had a homemade sticker on the back that says, we love New York. Now, as a Southerner, I can tell you that most Southern people don't like carpetbaggers, you know, Northeast intelligentsia and New Yorkers and all the, you know. But they did after 9-11. We were all one, except for the black hats in some you know, faction somewhere. I saw that, and that brought me to tears. And my producer was with me. She was a wonderful Southern woman. And it, we brought us, because she, she and I knew that he meant it. You know, and he's got a gun rack with assault rifles and, you know. 
you know, and this, this is what the South, you know, a lot of the people down there, you know, they're all about God guns and country and, you know, God damn it. Don't, don't mess with us, you know? And so that really left an impression on me. Um, and so it's the same with UFO disclosure. You know, the people of the world, American, I can only speak for Americans. I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm world traveled, but I don't know a lot of foreign people. I wish I did. Um, but I know a few, um, by and large, people can handle this stuff. We've been through World War II, the Holocaust, Vietnam was horrifying. Um, you know, missing in action. Where are the missing people? You know, is that related to my labs? Are people being abducted, you know, en masse? I believe there's truth to that. So I think that's part of the wild stuff that, you know, Chris and Lou, you know, I appreciate what they're doing, but they're slow rolling disclosure, in my view. I don't speak for them. I, I speak only for myself. And while I understand they're cautionary, but this is ridiculous because they're being, they're slowly being, the disclosure movement's moving past all that. I, I agree with Richard Dolan when he said that Chris Mellon and, and Lou, they're just moving the goalposts further down the line. And so they're creating this new space of disclosure that's really not. And so, you know, though I am friends with Chris, you know, I disagree with his, his program. Uh, they are lying by omission. The Navy doesn't, it's not a mystery. The Navy knows what that is. They test uh, secret craft all the time with the other branches of the military. And they're like, oh my God, a UFO. And it's our stuff. People are like, oh, that's impossible. You know, they think we have a few weapons in the U.S. Space Force. And it's like, no, you know, I, I believe we're way out in the galaxy. And that suggests Stargate travel and transdimensional, you know, space travel is time travel. You know, it's part and parcel. So DARPA, time travel stories, MKUltra, Montauk Project, you know, it lends credibility to that when I see this stuff. Because I understand they're scared to death of all this stuff getting out, whatever the truth is. Well, it's funny, it's funny you mentioned the time travel thing. I mean, something that you mentioned in one of your emails to Jean-Luc was the TV series Dark and how it was based on Project Montauk and the link to Brookhaven Labs, going on to say that um, Brookhaven was a US Air Force time tunnel testing facility. Now, I have an intelligence source who has operated on behalf of the NSA and also the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. He was also an intelligence consultant on all three seasons of Dark. And when I asked him if you were correct regarding Brookhaven and Project Montauk, he confirmed that you were. He also said to me um, a few times now that the 19, I think it was the 1950s, uh, the, the supposed agreements between select members of the US military and the ET race that we call Ebens were real, that those meetings did take place, that these agreements involved the exchange of technological assets with applications in time travel. Um, I've also been told by him that there are, to their knowledge, three converging human timelines and that some of the ETs are actually human beings from separate timelines and that the splitting of the atom was the catalyst that ushered them in, that we essentially converged with other timelines due to splitting the atom. Have you ever had that type of narrative explained to you by intelligence community folks or, or anyone? I, I didn't need them to do that. I knew it on my own from my own research. Remember, Dr. Oppenheimer, World War II, after they dropped the, the bomb on Japan, he said, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. That's from the Vedic texts. Yeah, because yeah. Strong evidence in, in the Mohenjo-Daro in, in, in India of you know, melted glass and, and melted stone from high heat explosions. And so I think it's obvious that atomic weapons have been used, sadly, all throughout human history, going way back. And so... The, what Oppenheimer knew, and I write about this in my new book, uh, when you let off a, an atomic device, it not only affects the local battlefield at hand, but it cuts through the fourth and into right. the fifth dimension, creating billions of additional casualties. That's why in World War II, all of a sudden the Foo Fighters, and there was increased UFO traffic and visitation is because they were like, shit, Somebody's taught them, taught the human race how to do the atomic device. And of course, the Nazi SS had the Vedic texts. I write about this too. 